Greetings, everyone. I am thrilled today to be in conversation with Betsy Politan, and we're going to be talking about her book, Humanual, and her incredible work. But let me give you a little bit of her background before we get into conversation. She's an internationally known breathing, movement, and somatic trauma work specialist who, as I said, is the author of Humanual, An Epic Journey to Your Expanded Self. She leads international trainings and co-teaches with Peter Levine and Gabor Mate. So, and you've got quite an incredible history in terms of your background and experience and Part of what I really love and respect in your work, Betsy, is your deep understanding of our unity in terms of the integration of our mind, body, spirit, and connection to the universe. So, the big one. Yes. (laughs) So, thank you for being here. Well, Heather, uh, thank you for having me. And I'm really honored to be in this space with you as I've watched many YouTube videos and learned a lot and respect so much your both your individual videos and the people that you interview. And mm-hmm. when I was thinking about this, I was recognizing that right now is this Indian holiday called Pitru Paksha. And it's the time when we honor ancestors and teachers and people that have sort of, you know, moved us along in life. And I thought the people that you've had on your program and you and, you know, the people that basically have allowed us to be here today Mm. and to talk about what we're going to talk about. It's really um, a special time that we honor um, the people that we kind of stand on their shoulders. And and here we are today because of what other people have done for us. Mm. Paved the way. Honor them today and honor those ancestors, teachers, guides, and those in the other realms that are supporting us now as we're in this profound transformational time on the planet. Exactly, exactly. So I think part of the sort of what what we might call new way of life is honoring that on a regular basis, Mm. not just at the holiday time, but, you know, but that's, bringing that into our everyday life. Even though it is in there, you know, bringing it more to consciousness, I guess. Yes, absolutely. And speaking of teachers, I would love to get into your journey, into the work that you're doing and the integrative work you're doing now. But you had a story about an early teacher who had a profound impact on the trajectory you went in with your So talk about that. Sure. I I love this story because it's so, I don't know, random in a way. So I was, when I was younger, I was a dancer. So at a certain point, I wanted to take a choreography class. And a choreography class, for those who don't know, is you take this and you learn how to make dances. So this was in 1968. So I signed up for this choreography class and the teacher happened to be this man named Albert Pesso. And for those of you in the sort of therapeutic world, uh, Albert Pesso is the inventor of the somatic practice uh, therapy of um, psychomotor therapy. It's a fairly popular somatic therapy. But back then he was inventing it or you know, making you know, bringing it, the pieces together, and so he was inventing it on us in the class, exploring it with you. Exactly, exploring it, getting his data, so to speak. And so one of the exercises that we did 
was he had everybody stand in a circle and one person stood in the middle and the person in the middle faced one person in the circle, actually one person, then one person like that. And they stood with their arms extended like that. Mm -hmm. Now, some people felt joy and welcomed and wonderful and other people cried, you know, at like, this was unfamiliar, it, is it possible? I mean, so many different emotional possibilities. But for me, what I remember was that moment of the physicality, the body position related to emotion and noticing it in a conscious way, because obviously we notice that all the time, but not consciously. And so there was this moment where it was the self, other, space in between, and the circle. And I know in your work, um, in your book, From Trauma to Freedom, you talk about the, the medicine circle and the importance of that. And so that moment of the, the oneness in that unified moment just st stuck with me and is the basis of my work 50 years and my explorations 50 years later. Because so, it, it seems like it really supported your increasing exploration of how much we communicate in the very ways that we move. So, so much of what our bodies are communicating to us, our bodies are communicating to other people is expressed through how we move. Exactly, exactly. And often yeah, that element of life is overlooked or looked at as not important or, you know, uh, not recognized. And yet there's so much information there on all the levels it's the physicality, the, the psychological, the emotional, the spiritual, the connections are, are vast. You know, one of the things that I really love in your book and in Humanual is your, you describe the expanded self, which is this integration of all the parts of us, and you describe it as synchronized embodiment. Yes. And what I appreciate in your work is you're really honoring, I would say it this way, you're honoring the sacredness of the body. And we live in a time where there's often a lot of disconnection from yes. our body. And you're calling us back into that awareness of the sacredness of the body and its critical role in our being in a unified and expanded sense of self. Absolutely. And it's something that we can't, um, we can't really avoid bumping into. And, and when we speak of the body in, in this way, what I'm referring to is the living body. And that the body, my, I, I usually don't even use the word body by itself, you know, in a way it's just, it's body, mind, self that that holds, that cherishes, that hides, that displays every experience we've ever had, every encounter, all the times and places, they all live in this fabric of um, the layers of meaning woven into our muscles and the fascia and the tendons and the memories etched in our bones it's like we're so alive with all of this the somatic living body I think you have to work hard to not feel it well and I love in light of that that you never call yourself a body worker because no. you're always dealing with the whole unified self right right as far as I'm concerned there is no such thing as a body worker 
in, you know, a body worker on cars or something, maybe, <laughs> but, but it's like, what, what would that be? What would a body worker do? You know, it's, it's a very strange, like, you can't, I can't move my arm without thinking I'm going to move my arm. Or what does it feel like to move my arm? I mean, it's all there. All connected. And so to block it out. Actually, there's something I recently read that I think is fascinating in, in this living body idea that when a child is breastfed, there is a slight vacuum between the mom and the baby. And in that vacuum, the baby's saliva goes back into the mother. And then the mother's immune system measures that and then gives the baby back through the milk what they need for their health. Wow, beautiful. Like, is that a living body or... Well, and this profound level of communication happening at that level of embodiment. Exactly, exactly. And how how we're taken care of, you know, through how our bodies really, I believe, are designed for well-being. Mm. No matter what we do, which we'll get into a little more, but... Um, yeah, talk about how your work then moved into working with trauma. Sure. Yeah. So from my my choreography class, I I did uh, spend years as a dancer, and it was not so much to, you know, be beautiful on stage or you know move beautifully, whatever. It my my interest became very quickly. How can we move and stay healthy in ourselves? And so I worked a lot in uh, repair from injury and injury prevention. Like how that was my, how can you move and not injure your shoulder? How can you move and not injure something? How, well, basically, how is our physicality designed? And so I did that for many years and loved that. Oh, there's, well, I'll tell you the, um, one of my teachers, cause we're honoring teachers. We used to go to the ballet together and sit in the, you know, third balcony or whatever in, in those days. And a dancer would be on stage doing something and she would say, he's going to fall off that turn before he would you know, as he, and sure enough, he fell off the turn because the muscles are pulling a certain way. It's going to do that. And so that became fascinating. Like how is somebody moving that's pulling them off their turn, you know, kind of thing. And so that led me to the Alexander technique, which I, you know, been doing for many, many years and it's beautiful, lovely work. And I was working with uh, performers, actors and musicians mostly. And then so, especially with the vocalists, I became really interested in breathing. And uh, I worked with a man named Carl Stow, which I'd be happy to talk about in a, in a little bit. Brilliant, brilliant breathing work. So I was working with people and somebody would come in and maybe have back pain. That's a common thing. And so some people I worked with and, you know, either moved or helped move and the back pain would get better. And other people, when they were with me, the back pain would get better, but then it didn't stay better kind of thing. So I was what am I missing? What's, what's, um, what's not showing for me? And then in the late nineties, I read, um, Peter Levine's seminal book, Waking the Tiger. 
And as I read that, I was like, what? Trauma? I have to pay attention to trauma? Because I was not particularly interested in, in that side of things. I was like, how was health and well-being and, you know, all of that. It's like I wasn't into the shadow or the trauma. And yet I realized, oh, because I realized that that person with the lower back pain was like, could it be that <clears throat> that back pain was from when they were, you know, three or four years old and something happened. This actually happened with a, a, a student of mine once. She was on a slide and somebody came down and, and that back pain stayed through all of that. So all of my adjustments, breathing and, you know, <laughs> wasn't going to do anything until we touched that moment of that. And so now it's, to me, it's, it's fascinating because, you know, a lot of our, our talk now is about moving into a, a, a new paradigm, the Aquarian paradigm. And what is preventing us from opening to that connection and, and beauty and oneness and light? If we have, you know, these things yeah. need to be touched. I mean, beautifully said, Betsy. And as you probably know, that's an ongoing theme in, in my work, the importance for us to heal and clear the trauma from the past, because we can't move into that expanded consciousness unless we clear those blocks and constrictions from the trauma from the past. And part of what's really powerful in your work is you talk a lot about those adaptive patterns those coping mechanisms we take on with trauma. Yeah. You, you, you were just giving an example of physical trauma, but for so many of us, the trauma is emotional. Yes. And you talk so uh, clearly in your book about how emotional constriction or trauma leads to physical constriction or ways where we've you know, adapted to cope with that trauma that we then continue to carry. Yes. And it not only affects us physically, it's affecting us in terms of the freedom with which we can express ourselves and be ourselves. Exactly. So the body is often a critical messenger trying yeah. to guide us to be aware of what needs to heal. Totally, totally. And one of the important really important pieces of what you just said is yes we most of us i, I want to say all of us have been in environments when we were young that were less than optimal and there was some kind of misattunement meaning we weren't seen for who we are and so we had to, as you were saying, create these adaptive patterns. Now, the important thing is, as I was saying, is that to, because these adaptive patterns now show up as things like, oh, I want to get rid of that. I don't like that. You know, it's like, say I have a, uh, now I have a, my voice is soft and I can't really talk loud and I'm really wanting to work on that. And so I want to get rid of this soft voice. But it's like, when we look back, um, I grew up in a household that, say the parents were rageful in some way or something, and I, I couldn't really speak. I had to talk in this soft voice. So that soft voice, actually, when the pattern was laid down, it was laid down unconsciously, but it was necessary. Protecting you. It's a survival pattern. Mm. So now, whenever we want to shift any of these things that we want to get rid of about ourselves, you know, we must first say thank you. 
Mm. Mm. You saved me back then. Mm. If back then I said, hey, I don't like what's going on in this house, that would not have gone well. You are again your 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 physicality, your emotion, your spirit, your system has it figured out for you. And I think that's so um crucial, the thank for, the thank you part. I, I, I think that's beautiful because our body then is supporting us in what's protective in that moment. But I also over the years and through all the trauma work that I've done in my own life and with other people, have come to respect and honor the wisdom of the body. Exactly. Because not only does it adapt in these ways to protect us in times of trauma or danger, but a lot of my trauma work with people was also related to early trauma, attachment issues, early pre-verbal trauma. Yes. We're, we often have no memory of those experiences. Right. And yet they shape us in such deep fundamental ways. Yes. And it's often the body that actually holds the memory. Yes. Communicates it through symptoms or different yes. sensations and that's the body's way of trying to call our attention to what we're carrying that we don't even remember exactly. that we need to feel. Exactly. Like I often say, <clears throat> I work with people who have trauma, but don't know they have trauma. Yeah. You know, because even as you start to work with somebody, like one time I started to work with this young actor and she was doing a, a monologue of some sort. And she said, she stopped and she said, you know, I always, I always want to hold my head in a certain position. And I said, well, that's a little strange. Your head is able to move in many positions. And then I said, is there any reason for that? And she said, no, like I had a very happy childhood, you know, very nice family, nothing major ever happened. And I said, okay. And that's related to what you just said. Most people, when you ask them, they say, no, nothing ever happened. No, my life was fine, you know. And yet, so we, I went on with this young woman and she, she said, oh, wait a minute. When I was younger, I was swimming in the ocean and a wave hit me. And I said that. And that was the exact position that her head was stuck in. Mm. So in that moment, the wave hit her and she kind of froze there. But part of her still thinks she's in the moment of being hit by that wave. But in our society, <clears throat> nobody thinks that's important. You know, nobody thinks, oh, you got hit by a wave. Okay, you know, get up and move on with your life. Instead of like, oh, wow, are you okay? Yeah. And so it's it's just glossed over. You know, and it's it's also this rem conversation reminds me of Gabor Mate, who you work with, who I have profound respect for. And he talks about how illness is is almost always coming out of the roots of trauma. Exactly. And again, our body is trying to get our attention through the physical symptoms or the illness yes. to help us become conscious of what those emotional roots are and origins are so that we finally have a chance to clear it and heal it. And how sad it is that in our traditional medical system, most of the focus is just how do we get these symptoms to go away? Right. Whereas you're saying if we honor the body and enter into communication with the body, which is part of what I do in trauma work, dialogue with that part of the body, dialogue with that illness. Yes. What is your body trying to tell you yes. that you need to know in order to heal? Yes. Yes. And, and often it's it feels like a little bit of a scary place to go and yet once you go there it's like oh 
that, that was fine. You know, like the woman, you know, with the, with the neck thing, it, it's like what happened was she, she said, Oh, I got hit by a wave. And I said that. And so she went like, Oh, 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 <laughs> and then it's just undone. Well, we heal when that trauma comes to awareness and in terms of the emotional trauma, when those young parts of us finally feel seen and heard and supported, yes, then they can heal. They're no longer frozen in time. Exactly. In that moment of the trauma. Right. But we can finally heal and then integrate into our whole system. Right. And is that some of the work that you do when you're doing trauma work is help those parts that are holding the wounds and the way the body is carrying that to come yeah. into consciousness to heal and clear and be integrated. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then that sort of brings us to the, the idea of the, one of the ideas of the expanded self, you know, because life comes along with all these um, difficult moments that nobody helps us with basically. And we just get the, these constricted and then you know, we have these constrictions holding us <clears throat> and we want to be part of this beautiful oneness that's going on. And part of me saying, I'm not going there. I'm, I'm, I'm constricted, you know? And so I think that's, you know, I mean, it's important in terms of health and all that, but it's important in terms of this larger paradigm that we're entering into and, and it's being offered to us is, um, you know, trauma takes us out of that and then letting that healing happen to let us enter into these larger spaces or these higher frequencies and vibrations that are available. And I think that's the exciting thing about now. And I'm wondering if that's even why, I'm sorry, that, that trauma is so popular now it's very popular. well i i think you know we we've been through time and i think astrologically when trauma really started to come to our awareness was when pluto moved into scorpio and all of a sudden early trauma sexual abuse physical abuse emotional abuse issues that had been taboo that had been pushed into the collective unconscious as well as our personal unconscious all started to come to the surface. So it, it was as wow. if Pluto wow. was saying, it's time to face what's been in the shadows. And I think as we're in this accelerated time of transformation and transition on the planet, as you were saying, I feel like we have this support to heal in a more accelerated way so that we can expand and move into this higher consciousness and i love in your book you talk about how often when you work with people they start to feel like they actually have more space inside yes it creates yes. freedom more capacity yes. to be in our expanded awareness and expand itself yes yes let should we do something with that sure so before we, uh, I'll talk you through a very simple um, experience of expanded self. Um, but before we do that, it's important to recognize that just below our skin, everybody, there's a layer um, of fascia. Fascia is a type of connective tissue. And fascia forms a full full whole body continuous three-dimensional matrix of uh, structural support that's around our organs our muscles our joints our bones our nerve fibers I mean it's everywhere so we are wearing an elastic suit that's multi-directional uh, multi-dimensional and allows us to move in so many different ways so if we just take in for a moment that we all, whether we feel it or not, there is physiologically this elasticity all through us. 
So if we just recognize that, and then with that in the background, so to speak, start to pay attention to your breathing. And you don't have to try to change it. You don't have to sit up straight. You don't have to do anything, just wherever you are, paying attention to your breathing. And more important right now or focused now is the movement of your breathing. So you can either do that from inside yourself, or if you wanna put your hand here, you can feel some movement for most people. So just begin to feel that as you breathe, there are internal shape changes, one way or another. And see what happens as you start to notice those shape changes. And again, you're not pushing, you're not forcing, you're not pulling, you're not counting. It's just whatever your breath is, is fine. And as you watch those shape changes, eyes open, eyes closed, however you're comfortable, just see if they don't tend to spread a little bit. Because when something moves and then it touches the something next to it, it, it can spread like ripples. Just notice if any of that is happening. And then when you feel ready, if your eyes are closed, you can open your eyes and look around your space with that little bit of expansion that happened inside. And that's a slight moment of your expanded self. Mm. That's beautiful, Betsy. Yeah. It's so interesting, just as I was in that experience, I noticed how just paying attention to my breath deepened my breath. Exactly. And deepened that sense and experience of being in the present moment. Exactly. Which then when you had us open our eyes, it's like everything has more vibrancy. Exactly. I felt more present. Yes. And that was two minutes, maybe. Yeah. It, it doesn't, it's so available to us. And as we're saying these days, more and more. And the breath seems so important to be aware of. I know, you know, many use focusing on the breath in their meditation practices, yes. but also I, in, in when I pay attention to my breathing, I realize how much when I'm anxious or under stress, my breathing becomes much more shallow. Absolutely. And again, we're, we're, you know, I feel that sense of starting to constrict. Yep or disconnect from myself or what's going on around me. And then to come back into breathing more deeply just brings me more back into connection with myself. Yes. And then in connection with what's around me. Exactly. And again, looking at the, our design, our breath is very good at stopping us from feeling emotion. Mm. If I'm interacting and somebody says something hurtful or and I feel tears come up and I don't want to cry in public or whatever, I, what's the best thing to do? You see kids, you know, you can't do it. No, you can't do it. Holding their breath. <laughs> Hold your breath that will hold that emotion down. So that adaptive pattern will show up a lot for most of us. And now with the, I want to say interesting thing about it is that if I hold my breath and I interfere with that particular system, we have lots of systems, that would be one thing. But 
because we have lots of systems and pathways and, and to things moving inside of us that when one system gets constricted, other systems get constricted too. And so our, we, you were mentioning before about our health. Yeah. Our health goes off, our digestion, our respiratory, you know, it all, it's all interconnected. <laughs> it's one thing. Yeah. So really you're saying health at the physical level, at the emotional level, at the spiritual level is about being in right harmony. Yeah. Yes. And, and being aware of where we're constricted or where we're discordant so we can come back into right harmony. Exactly. Exactly. And the, you know, the sort of um, common thinking or not not uncommon thinking is it like oh the body doesn't matter kind of thing it's like or or another one that's popular and this was beautiful in um your interview with Anne Bar Baring Bering? Bering yeah she said the patriarch I mean she's this elegant you know woman and speaking and she said the patriarchy she said one of the things that, is that they view the body as so mechanistic. And I'm like, yeah, that's, yeah. That's so, we're not a machine. Well, and it's a lot of, yeah. And a lot of what Anne talks about and, and others that, that, you know, part of the, the wounding for us collectively as we moved into the patriarchal period was a devaluation of the body. Right. And, you know, the, the, age of Taurus prior to moving into that patriarchal period, the body was seen as sacred, the earth was seen as sacred, the sacred feminine wisdom is about the sacredness and the consciousness of the body and of all life around us. And part of what I think is powerful in your work, Betsy, is you're calling us back into that sacred feminine wisdom exactly. of how to regain and remember the yeah. sacredness of the body and how we need to come back into that deep relationship and connection with our bodies to be I, whole. Even the word remember put the members back together. <laughs> the members, you know, the disconnection. Yeah. Put, put it, put it back together. And I and I love in your work, you you also emphasize that we can't connect with our spirituality by leaving our bodies. It's through the body yes. that we can expand. So, can you talk more about that too? Yeah, because um, it's on it's on so many levels um, that you know that the way out of the body is through the body. I think that's a, one of the titles of the. Because I think I, I I learned a lot about this uh, over the years. I would be uh, called to teach at either a meditation center or an ashram <clears throat> where people were really devoted to spiritual practice. And in some of these, and also in some religions, it's like, oh, the body doesn't matter. You know, it's just my spiritual is is all there is and that of course rubs me a little bit funny anyway because i'm so interested or to me it's just not a separate thing you know it's it's one living entity that we are but anyway so i'd be um working with somebody and like they would say when they're meditating they their their shoulders are killing them you know so then i'm thinking well if you're meditating your shoulders are killing you you're meditating on that pain mm. and so how are you going to get to the higher realms when you're kind of stuck in your body <laughs> 
and fighting your body or trying to override your body. Exactly. Yes. Or pretend, you know, either like it just, it's not going to go away. Those things don't go away usually unless they're addressed one way or another. And I'm not saying my way is the only way to address them, but things need to be addressed because if we really want to open to what's really available to us, then there's a there's a unity, there's an em- synchronized embodiment that wants to be part of that. It makes me think of your interview with uh, Professor Robert Temple. I was listening to that. It, it was, you know, it's brilliant, the uh, new science of heaven. Mm-hmm. And he's talking about the clouds and the plasma and all that. And I'm thinking this, okay, okay. And then he said that there's a spot or two spots that um, where the gravitational pull between the earth and the moon is zero and they balance each other out. So the moon can't pull you toward it and the earth can't pull you. And I thought, whoa, that's exactly the lightness that I like to talk about. And then he said, these points are called L4 and L5. And I was blown away because anybody that lives at all in the orthopedic or medical or has had back pain of any sort is usually at lumbar four or five or L four or five. It's a very common um, verbiage, you know, in that world. And I'm thinking, he just said at L four, L five. And for him, it's the Lagrange points. I think that's what he... Mm -hmm. And the location of those plasma clouds that hold the memories. Exactly. The consciousness of the planet. So that's interesting too. Absolutely. And this place where many people, I mean, uh, I'm not sure if it's true now, now, but years ago when I they used to say the, the, the biggest difficulty that people had was back pain. You know, I'm not sure it's true now, but it, it was, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, like more than um, a lot of other things, it was back pain. And so, which means, so we've, we've talked a little about this, like what, so when I heard all that, it was like, what do we do with that? As above, so below. <laughs> exactly. And what do you make of L4 and L5? What what meaning do they have for you in terms of the physical body? Yeah. Well, you know, we have the our, our, our vertebrae, or you know, with the discs in between. And usually there's some kind of compression, which pushes the disc either this way or this way and that's usually where the l it's usually at lumbar four or five is the most common place so there's some kind of stuckness so if we're thinking about the zero grab balancing each other Mm. but stuck there and that's kind of at the midpoint of the body too isn't it so that it it might actually also be this disconnect from, you know, uh, the the more mental part of ourselves from the more physical embodied parts of ourselves. From right, right, the upper and the lower of some sort. But it's just so interesting how, you know, for me, I just happened to hear it, and how many other people thought, "Huh, isn't that a coincidence?" L four five. I've heard of that. And it reinforces my, I believe, and maybe we can do a practice to explore this, that we can actually feel that that zero place. We can feel where the balance happens in us. That's available on this planet. It's available to feel. That is so true on so many levels. I mean, that's the, the heart of uh, Ibrahim Karim's biogeometry and 
you know, I know that there are forms of healing, zero balancing. They're all yes. about getting us into that connection with the zero point, with source point. Exactly. Knowing that that's within us, it's available around us. And that can pull us into that place of stillness. Yes. So we can come back into connection with yes. ourselves and with source. Yes. Where we can heal and then expand our consciousness. Yes. Yeah. And that reminds me, um, you've interviewed Rory Duff. And with his work, one of the things that he said is that at the nodes where the meeting places of these at the at the meeting of the nodes is stillness is available there yes and that source energy exactly. which is the wisdom and love of the cosmos that we can access when we open to that but circling yeah. back to something you were saying before betsy that i've experienced is being in in meditation centers or ashrams i've also been aware at times that that people who have unresolved trauma are often trying to be in that continual meditative state to escape yes. the trauma, the feelings, the unresolved issues. But what I witnessed is then you see the difference between uh, deep meditation that leads to more and more integration of the whole self mm. versus dissociation. Right. Where or what's called it's a spiritual, spiritual bypass. bypass. Yeah. And that, like you said, you know, opening to that expansive spirituality is through the body, not by escaping the body, that it is again integrating the wholeness of who we are and clearing any blocks, any constriction, any trauma yeah. that's going to hold us back from that capacity yeah. to yes. expand our consciousness. And, and that's a part of what we need to clear to move into the higher consciousness that we're moving into now. Yes. And I think the, the knowledge or awareness or, or of our particular path is pointed out to us all the time <laughs> you know in our interactions as i was saying with self other what's in between you know something interaction it's like oh what is it you know you feel any time that you feel tension it requires attention it's mm, a good way to put it yeah and and, and so each of us, I mean, we it can sound a little bit like we have to sort of solve these big things, but it, it's not that. It's it, it's it's these small moments of noticing, huh, why did I that but that person said bother me so much? Or why did I tense like that when this person walked by, but not when that person walked by? You know what? And and so it's not not available. It is available. But do we want to bring our consciousness and our awareness to this? And I think that's a choice. That's one of the choice points that we all have as part of what's going on. It's a choice, right? And when you realize, as Joe Dispenza and others say, that 90% of our emotions, behaviors, actions are controlled by are unconscious. Absolutely. Yes. Then part of what you're saying that's so critical is the more we're in that observer witness self, the more we're bringing what's unconscious into the light of awareness, right. then we actually have more choice and more freedom rather than operating out of this contracted, constricted, adaptive coping pattern yeah. that no longer serves us. Exactly. And and that's sort of a, a big point there that, that it, it did serve us at one point, but it doesn't serve us anymore. And so and and it's it's not as simple as it sounds, as we all know, who've, you know, sort of walked this path, because one of the reasons I think is that when the pattern, well, a couple of things, one is when the patterns were laid down, they were not laid down consciously. 
none of us said, oh, I think I'll be afraid every time I do this, or I think I'll not do this, or I think I'll uh, feel unworthy, you know, any, any of those things that we tell ourselves. And so it was laid down, not in a conscious way. So you can't just get rid of it in a, by saying, oh, there's that. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to do that anymore. You know, it, it's a little, takes a little like <laughs> the back door kind of thing, you know, um, I get it. Well, this reminds me, I recently taught a class. Yeah. Let's do the support thing. And I'll tell you the story afterwards. Cause it'll make more sense. Should we yeah, do-, before you do that? Let me just say that I think as you're saying, part of our orientation too often is to try to get rid of what we see as the problem. Exactly. And I think part of what you, you, your, your book is so filled with very accessible, practical exercises. And a lot of them are about observing ourselves, tuning into ourselves. And from my perspective, when we hold all those facets of ourselves, including those things that bother us, exactly. hold them all with compassion then we're actually able to be in relationship with them instead of trying to get rid of them. Right. And then we can integrate the message that experience, that symptom, that part of us is trying to tell us yeah. to heal exactly. and transform. And that's the expanded self too. And let me also add that the expanded self is not always in this sort of expanded state or this um, wonderful feeling kind of thing. Because if I am in a situation, you know, especially as a child and the the household is um, difficult and I make myself smaller to manage that, that's the expanded self also. Because that's a wise place to go. Mm. It's again the coping mechanism. Yeah. So we we have to think of again all facets of it. <laughs> so yes, lead us in another exercise. That'd be great. Yeah, okay. So we we live in a gravitational field. And because of that, we need to adapt to it. And very few of us walk around thinking, I'm in gravity, how am I going to adapt? You know? <laughs> But but there is a part of me, all of us, that is dealing with that all the time because we don't want this, especially this, to hit the ground. So we have, this is a sim- very simple, not exactly accurate, but it works okay. Gravity comes this way. The earth is spinning, gives off a centrifugal force. Something from the planet is coming up all the time. Mm. Plants grows, trees grows, and even we as as humans, you know, we we tend toward verticality. Mm. Babies are just, you know, something about verticality interests us. So we have this and this, and that's where we meet the planet. That's where we live our life from. So right now. <clears throat> Pay attention to whatever is under you because that's your contact with the planet, whether it's through your shoes or your feet or the chair or the couch or whatever, whatever is under you, just pay attention to the interface of you and where you meet the planet. And it's obvious that the ground is under you But what's not so obvious is that the ground is under you in a supportive way. So what happens now as you recognize the ground is supporting me? In that split second moment, the ground is supporting me. Something happens. And then to go a little further, I want to be open to receive that. So my ankles free enough to receive support. My knee joints 
free enough to receive support. My hip joints. So we have the major joints in our legs. And back to the ground, we lose that contact so easily and quickly. And then my lower torso, supported. Middle torso, and upper torso, your breath, and your upper torso includes your arms. Your arms are supported from the ground. They're not these heavy hanging sausage-like things. They're supported. And then your neck and your head supported from the ground, receiving uprightness. Uprightness is not something that we paste on. It's something that we receive. And then when you're ready, look around your space with that support from the ground. And in that moment, or in this moment, I have the earth, the ground, me, and my environment, whatever I see, both near and far. In that moment of unity or oneness, the planet, me, and everything is palatable. And that feeling of some privilege point of me, <laughs> I am doing all of, you know, can be not there. Mm -hmm. There is no privilege point. There's the unity mm -hmm. and the oneness. And I think the more we practice paying attention to ourselves in this way, I mean, it's real, it's available. You don't have to mm -hmm. put on gym shorts or, or anything, you know. It's in every moment you choose to live this. I think this is the Aquarian and that web that's connected between us because you doing that and me doing that there's no you and me <laughs> mm, it's beautiful betsy i could feel that and part of what I, I love in that simple practice is it reminds us of our interconnectedness exactly. with all exactly. things with each other and the earth the sky all that is and i love that theme of receiving uprightness not fabricating it or forcing it manipulating it. through the relationship with the earth yeah and i think that that is a huge theme of the aquarian age is moving out of our sense of separation yeah. back yeah. into right relationship with ourselves with the earth with the sky with each other with all that is yes so that then we remember that we're part of that unity consciousness yeah but we also remember that we can find that place of stillness and the center within us and it is in all that is exactly yeah yeah and it's you know as you've talked about you know the sacred masculine and the sacred feminine you know it's just the the sacredness <laughs> in general yeah quite beautiful and again part of what's so powerful in your work betsy is you are guiding us not only in how to reconnect and remember the sacredness of our bodies and how our bodies can help us heal and help us reintegrate and help us expand so that we can in an integrated way move into higher consciousness yes. but you're also supporting us in remembering the wisdom of our bodies our yes. bodies never forgot their interconnectedness exactly we in our heads forget that and yes. disconnect from that yes. but our bodies carry that truth 
every moment, every yeah. day. Yes. Yeah. And when you say that, it kind of reminds me, um, we'll save this other piece for uh, another conversation of how we got here, you know, but as we're here from my observations, we have a primitive body self. We have a social body self and we have a divine body mm -hmm. self and different parts are going to come out at different times you know you're in your social self you behave a certain way you don't do other things and all of but the divine is in everybody and of course spiritualities and religions even have been teaching that forever so beautiful and again it's it's all interconnected within us but it, it's interesting to hear you talk about that in direct connection with the body our embodiment as well and again i wow. love that phrase synchronized embodiment yes yeah 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 because it is both about coming back into that awareness of our wholeness our interconnectedness within all these facets of ourselves but also that whole notion of synchronization coming back into right harmony right with aspects of ourselves it, yeah it makes me think you know because you i see you i i see the planets moving in this synchronized way you know it's all organized <laughs> and so are we yeah. yeah and i think that's another powerful theme of the aquarian age is is coming back into that right harmony like the shamans talk about remembering the song of your soul remember the harmony of the spheres because then we find our note our expression our right place yes. in that harmonic and yeah. then we feel and know what yeah. that's like to be back in balance yes and we can find that through our vibration through our frequency you know how what when you touch something, it has a certain frequency and it vibrates and emanates a certain frequency and vibration. And we got something to do that with. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. Well, thank yeah. you for the beautiful work that you're doing, Betsy, and the way in which you're helping so many people to heal and to move into that expansion of the self in an integrated and an interconnected way mm. and you know that idea like the the heart math you know that the, our hearts just emanate all around us i mean that's that's here too so thank you for having me and giving me this opportunity to um talk and and uh explore this magnificent realm that 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 we're both moving into and that is right here too. <laughs> Beautifully said. Yeah. And thank you to all of you who are listening and who are part of this interconnectedness that we're in in community to come back into harmony and right balance. Mm. Blessed be. Blessed be.